Thanks for joining me on Packaging Unboxed. Check that out. We're talking to Here Design. We're going to talk to them about Glenn Fittick's Time Reimagined Pack. Now, these packs are amazing. They were not created the way you typically create packs. They're not made out of paper. They're not made out of plastic. They've gone back in time, 50 years, gathered all the weather data, gathered materials from old packs. They ground them up, put them in this new pack, created the layers, almost like sediment. And each one of those tells a different story. We're going to go in and find out how they designed it, what kind of a strategy session they had, what software they used, who they partnered with. And like, we're going to get like an inside peek of what happened in the strategy room, as well as look at 3d prototypes and go through all the different processes that they went through and find out like what it means to deliver packaging for a $50,000 whiskey. It's insane. I'm super excited to share this with you. Do me a favor before we jump into the show, hit the subscribe button. Once again, my name is Avelio Matos and this is Packaging Unboxed. We're talking to the team at Here Design. We're going to talk about Glenn Fittich. We're going to talk about B Corp status and really kind of the whole design process. This morning, I got, I got Harry who's off getting samples. I've got Emily and Mark Patton. Mark, can you just give me a quick rundown of, of who you are and, and what Here Design does? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so we are a sort of multidisciplinary design team uh, based in London Fields in, in Hackney in London. And we work on a whole range of different projects from high-end packaging for the likes of whiskey, which we'll talk about today, but then also we work on lots of books and we work on identities for restaurants and hotels. Um, and we really sort of love that mix. We enjoy working and applying ourselves across the different challenges that you get with those different projects. Um, we're a sort of medium sized business here in London. So there is about 45 of us um, in the studio. Um, and in amongst that team, we've got um, a team of strategists, uh, a team of, of writers, a big design team with different skill sets. So that's a um, combination of like, um, sort of brands, uh, designers who will work on lots of different aspects of a brand, but then also uh, product designers and um, yeah, sort of more product design specialists, um, which is of course incredibly important for this project we'll talk about in a moment. And then we have a, a production team who helps kind of translate the, the design vision into, into reality. You said you're a medium sized business with about 45 people. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a huge team. It's a good size because we have it, it gives us the luxury of having um, lots of like, different experience and uh, lots of different skills in the studio because it's, it's quite a, it's quite a, a multidisciplinary team um, and the way we work is quite in in little I guess little clusters of different skills according to the project and um, so it might be that um, the likes of Harry would work with a writer on how you frame the idea or working with a strategist to kind of work out and how we present a kind of concept and. Um, the, the nice thing is the, the the project that we're going to talk about is is a really lovely embodiment of all of those skills actually applied. You know, I think like the first time I saw the Glenn Fittich time reimagined, that's what we're going to talk about, right? It's uh, it's the idea of time, you know, passing all in one package, which was crazy. But I, like the first time I saw it, I got to tell you that the one thing that popped into my head was the movie Interstellar. Yeah, the <laughs> textures, the colors. <laughs> <laughs> like the forms, I was like, wow, I, you know, um, it just, it just had like this feel of something completely new and different. And there was like story there. So, you know, as I start digging in, I'm like, wow, this is like, like this is more than just packaging in terms of like the, the packet. There's like a ton of story there. There's like, there's, like you said, textures, materials, colors. Where does this even start? Like, how does the concept, like does somebody walk in and they're like, I got it already. And it's like brewing in the back of your head or do you begin with strategy and then strategy kind of pulls that idea out. It was a really enjoyable process as a designer because of the strategic sort of foundations at the beginning and the, the way that we worked to sort of craft the strategy as a team. Um, and it was really also sort of testament to the way that Glenn Fiddick briefed us. You know, in, in the first instance, it was, we were, we were briefed to redesign Glenn Fiddick 50 uh, as a singular sort of variant, we'd been working with uh, Glenn Fiddick already for a few years um, at the other end of their portfolio, so establishing the sort of core range um, and having launched uh, the 12 year old and 15 year old together in its sort of new guise, they briefed us to say, okay, so what's the other end, you know, from paying 30, 30 odd pounds for a bottle, you know, what does 35 
thousand look like for a bottle and it began as this quite sort of conceptual piece of just what what are people buying when they buy a 50 year old whiskey um and they really gave us license to yeah explore that strategically concept you know high level concepts as to what that could mean and um it was sort of from that sort of overarching thinking that we arrived at these this idea of uh these aged liquids being ways of experiencing time in in very different ways and very you know us marrying those with concepts that um yeah challenge your perception of time being this chronological thing and ask you to think about it in a, in a different way um so that was kind of how it started um and as i say it was a very sort of collaborative strategic piece at the start where we were all just trying to think you know there was lots of staring into the middle distance thinking about time and researching uh you know i'm sure christopher nolan came up several times to, uh, <laughs> part of the part of the process um, so it's great that, he, that he's been referred to already in the, in the podcast but um and as it it began as that brief of 50 year old and then Glenfiddich was so sort of engaged with the idea and some of the concepts that didn't make it through to the, the final design for 50, they, it, the range was born. You know, we, we realized that 30 and 40 could be kind of encompassed within this overarching idea and form a, a set of expressions that sort of speak for the same world, essentially. Uh, so can you explain just to the listeners, like what, what the pack is? Basically, 30, 40, and 50 year old Glenfiddichs form the Time Reimagined series. And each one is its own expression of time in a, in a different, uh, yeah, different form. So the 30 year old um, is suspended time. Um, that speaks to the decisive nature of the 30 year old as a liquid and the sort of decisive moment um, that the malt master goes through in the process of creating that liquid. And in particular, the moment at which it's, it's ready, it's perfect, it's, it can go into the bottle. It's this beautiful expression of the Glenfiddich um, taste uh, profile at that age. And that as a design is, that's one of the ones I do actually have a, a sample of. Um, our challenge there from a design perspective was reflecting this idea of suspension um, within the pack itself. So how could we, we wanted to create a bottle where uh, a pack where the bottle is physically suspended. So I, I'm struggling to show it on my uh, webcam here, but there's nothing, you know, above and below the bottle. It's uh, held by this sort of horizontal diagonal plinth uh, within the pack. And it's in case these, this, these are sort of aluminium ribbons that are, you know, designed to look as though suspended in animation surrounding this sort of uh, suspended moment within which is the, the liquid of the, so what does the idea of suspension come from is it is it because this, this liquid is just is just being held for this duration of time and they can pull it before and bottle it for some other purpose or like the idea now is like they've committed to hitting this 30-year mark yeah it's it's exactly that it's that decisive moment of it being ready the malt master knowing you know it does, he does a tasting from the barrel and it's that moment where it is it is ready it is time and it's what it's just that suspended that idea of a moment being suspended in time sort of frozen and held that you know only with his skill and knowledge of the glenfiddich taste profile and the, the whiskey making process is he able to say now and it's that that reason we've sort of held it aim to sort of held the bottom in space like that you've got a 40 year old and a 50 year old the 30 and the 40 share the same decanter and then the 50 has its own like really angled uh, i mean they're they're both beautiful but like this the 50 year old has a visual difference just in the bottle itself what's the price difference between the 30 and the 50 i mean 30 is substantially the most expensive the 30 is more expensive than the 50 no, sorry, 50 is the most okay. expensive. <laughs> yeah, and the reason for it being in its own decanter, it's in, it's in crystal. It's a hand-blown um, decanter that we created with um, Brody Nairn up in uh, Scotland. Um, I've unfortunately not got a, uh, a recent sample of it, but this is one of the first blown 
um, pieces of crystal that he did into the model because he was really doubtful as to whether it was going to be able to be demountable from the, the moles that they blow into. So this is one of his first tests. But, it, you know, 50 really stands apart in terms of price point and um, is very much the sort of pinnacle of the portfolio. So it justifies its own decanter. Uh, 30 and 40 are closer together in terms of uh, the, the pricing in the portfolio. So they share um, the same decanter, um, but are dressed in, in quite different ways. You know, the, the jasmine light forms part of the, the design for the 40-year-old um, and has, you know, a much cleaner screen printed sort of decoration on the glass, whereas 30 retains the sort of paper label from, uh, you know, as its, as its key decoration. So day one, they bring the idea to you and you assemble a, a team of strategists, which you have. And then who else is in that room? I mean, it would have been as, as many of the, the different teams available to us as possible to, to sort of feed in those perspectives. You know, we try to get everybody's thoughts on a conceptual piece as early as possible in the process. And like Mark said, you know, we love to make use of everybody's, you know, tangibly different ways of thinking to feed into a strategy at that early point. So yeah, we would, in a, in a phase like that, we would have somebody from the rights department, somebody from strategy, design, um, digital, uh, audio, you know, we want to try and get everybody's perspectives in there as early as we can. It reminds me actually, Harry, when, when we were working on that, those first phases, one of the, one of the observations that we made at the time with it, with a object like this, you almost have to consider it as, um, it, not, not simply the pack. It's almost like within the pack, you're creating a concept that can kind of come alive in, in, in the way that it's presented to people. So we actually, as well as having, um, the, the skills that Harry's just listed, we also had, um, I think I'm right in saying it would have been Ruby or Patrick, Harry, sort of working quite specifically on the, the, stru- the sculptural forms or ideas, but then also thinking about how you would actually launch an object like that. And we had this idea of almost sort of reversing our thinking where we had, we wanted to think about concepts primarily so that that would um, take us to a new kind of space to think about packaging, but also thinking about it in the context of, the, the launch event that you might consider to, to bring that to people. So we actually, I think at that time presented. And that reversal was actually just quite an interesting uh, creative um, kind of mechanic to get us to think differently about this particular project, because it felt like it was um, an opportunity to sort of test our own Kind of create a process and our own kind of assumptions about what what these could become um so it was it was very literally this uh, a, a really big range of, of thinkers and i think that the, the the writing and the copywriting team were a sort of integral part of that as well when you're kind of trying to think about how you tell that story and how you can um elaborate it and it's quite it was one of probably one of the most kind of fun projects from a theatricality point of view because i think even in the very first presentations you know we were going quite far with like how you tell that story and kind of because it's it's quite a high concept for a brand to kind of engage with um and we felt like we had to really really it, commit to it in a way to sort of express that in, in a way that they that everyone could sort of envisage envisage so take us into that room right you've got everybody throwing out ideas kind of thinking through like time and then is the copy are the copywriters kind of pulling this information and then trying to build out a, sto- a narrative and then they kind of read it back and, and it, it ladders up into you know, new ideas from other people that may not have under may not have grasped it the way that they did. I think it's quite an organic yeah, it, dialogue, isn't it, Harry? It's kind of, it just, it, it sort of flows quite naturally, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. And it, it's a Mark's point about trying to think about things from the, experience first so putting a somebody into an experience that encapsulates this redefinition of time and then that resulting in seeing a pack that is a sort of physical embodiment of that experience the process kind of the inspiration point could come from anybody's thinking if that makes sense and you're you're completely right in the you know the rights department always being pivotal to kind of distilling that into an a sort of tangible narrative for then us to sort of held within the presentation and 
you know, to, to guide the client through, you know, articulating things verbally and then us coming up with, okay, what are the visuals, what are the mechanisms that we need to use to, to build this story in a way that feels um, credible and feels achievable for the client. Hugely important to get that sort of thread right. Yeah, so huge uh, shout out to the copywriters, right? Because usually on a, on a design podcast or in a design article, there's never like, hey, the copywriters were like such a big integral part of this. It's always like really focused on the design team. And it's it's great because like from a strategic standpoint, you get a bunch of designers into a room and you don't have somebody to like capture all that information and actually distill it. Uh, you can you can you can spin your wheels for for days. One of the things that we are kind of sort of experiencing or, or living is a sort of broadening of people's understanding about what those equ- equities are. So I think that the what what we're finding is that you know copywriting and writing uh, is just such an integral part of how you describe a brand and by creating a language that is bespoke to a client or a brand or a uh, entity um, you you can actually get to the point where that language becomes part of one of the equities of the, of the of the brand you know like there's a there's a good example that's not in the same realm um, and we didn't work on it to be clear. Uh, but um, there's a brand called Oatly in the UK who who do an oat milk. But they're, they're, one of their equities is the way they use language and the way they use copywriting. And for one of our kind of recent projects, we actually worked with a client to define a definition of their kind of distilling process and to allow them to trademark that. So I feel like I think as a sort of multidisciplinary design studio, our, our job is to harness every sort of touch point of a of an experience and and to make it as kind of powerful as possible for that uh, for the per- person who's experiencing it and and one of those le- levers so to speak is, is writing and tonality and the tone of voice um and it's actually it's a, it's a it's a discussion we're having at the moment which is there's a there's one hypothesis which is words people don't read as much let's say, you know let's say a sweeping statement that people read less but in a funny way i feel like words are actually even more important because they, they you know like the they're kind of almost like heightened and reduced and condensed and what you how you choose to express something is kind of really really important and um, so yeah so I, I think it's a really interesting kind of development of um of the industry i guess yeah absolutely no, and, and you're right um that sweeping statement of people reading less i would agree with but it doesn't mean that what they're what they're absorbing is any less important, right? So, from a, so you're now just taking a what you know what in the '70s used to be like a two paragraph ad of worth of copy, and just distilling it down to you know five words or less, like you know, yeah, exactly, it's that which is, which is you're getting like great copy, yeah. So with um, all right, so. I mean, this, this has got to be like the most complex concept you guys have worked on. Like, I can't imagine something more complex than time. <laughs> I think it was that, 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 that initial phase, like I say, there was some real head scratching. And like, I, I, what I was trying to touch on before is I think having writers and strategists available to help you unpick your own thoughts, you know, like to be challenged with a subject like time. You can find a thing, a video piece, a, like something that you think there's something in this, but I can't, can't quite articulate it. And just being able to put references like that into a, a room of people who think in those different ways, you can help, you know, like simultaneous time, which became the resultant concept for 50 year old. That took so many, so much kind of reshaping and rethinking to arrive at the point where it was. It's about experiencing everything from the last fifty years all in one instant. It feels so simple when you've arrived at that thought at the end, but actually we push that around in so many different ways. And then that you know that then sort of formed the brief, but we you can't get there without that. Um, yeah, without that sort of thoughtful process at the start. You've got the thirty-year-old. You've got those aluminum endless loops uh, uh, that are going around the pack. Then we look at the 50 year old and it's mm-hmm. a whole different material. So now it's not just the, the ribbons from a superficial standpoint, there's actual depth to those ribbons and yeah. then the material choices between just the, the layers in there. Like how do you, again, now you're condensing more amount of time. And I've read that there was incorporating data into the material, like how just explain that 
50 year old pack uh, and how that works and, and, uh, and how deep that really is. We arrived at through that idea of simultaneous time. We knew we wanted to create a pack that contained information, physical, was a physical embodiment of information from the last 50 years. And you write, as you say, the, the, the concept we arrived at was using the data. So we thankfully, uh, through an online resource from the Met Office, managed to gain the, in, gain weather data from the last, the 50 years that the whiskey was in the barrel. And with our, through our discussions with, um, Brian Kinsman, the malt master, we were able to identify the three factors that most affect whiskey while it's in the barrel. So then it became an exercise of, okay, we've got all of, we've got genuine information that has affected this liquid. How can we, with minimal sort of influence, you know, allowing the data to almost drive the structure itself, how can we translate it into something sculptural and, and beautiful? Um, so we, we knew we needed to collaborate with someone that, that level of sort of data engineering isn't something that we have in house. So we, we thankfully found Manuel Jimenez Garcia, who is, uh, in his terms, a computational architect. And it was, it was a real epiphany having him walk into the studio because we'd, we'd been, you know, we felt like we'd had such a revelation in finding this data. And then we were like, what yeah. on earth are we going to do with this? <laughs> And Manuel literally came in, showed us his portfolio and talked us through the things that he was passionate about. And it was that perfect Venn diagram of taking data and making something physical from it. And through a really exciting process with him, we managed to triangulate the data. Um, and essentially the pack that you see, I've got this tiny, <laughs> thankfully plastic version of it, um, which, uh, obviously is, is in miniature form, but the, the pack has these uh, lines that sort of traverse diagonally around the pack and form these triangulated facets. And each one of those represents one of the 50 years. And then through the, through the data from that 50 year, from that year in particular, the, the points have been triangulated. So we imposed certain conditions like the cylindrical format, the size of the structure, um, but then we allow the data to drive it, the depth and and shape of those facets. And then the next challenge was then, okay, what do we make this from now? And how do we yeah. how do we make it in a way that's going to you know satisfy the the, the price tag of the of the variant and um, achieve the quality standard that you know we set for ourselves? You've mentioned price tag a couple of times, right? And that the pack can deliver that perceived value. Mm. So when somebody's buying luxury, right? I mean, this is a, lu a luxury. This is a this is a high end Honda or like a low end Lexus, right? In terms of the cost of this uh, whiskey, when somebody's <laughs> buying luxury, like what are they buying? That's exactly what led us to the level of concept that we wanted. You know, luxury is about creating fantasies. It's about taking a product that has a genuine truth behind it something that ha is is born of real quality and craftsmanship and luxury is about then taking the the vision you know a vision of that brand and create crafting a fantasy for it um so ours was about identifying that truth in the liquid which is you know the the amount of information and and the amount of time that has gone into it and turning that into a fantasy and that's where we believe that you know perceived value comes in it, it felt like a real victory for us to design the pinnacle of the the glenfiddich um portfolio without using you know precious metals without you know things being gold it it's you know an aluminium casing which is you know not not deemed to be like the most luxurious metal in the world but it's what we've imbued that that surface with you know it, it it's that conceptual thinking and the, and the the level of attention to detail that's behind it and the story behind it that is the the thing that adds value. Yeah. And would would you say then going with like a, a precious metal, would that just be gimmicky and expected? Or was there a different reason for not going down that path? I think it's 
naturally there's an appetite for it in that area of the, the market. You know, it's it's an immediate signifier of value that this is worth putting putting platinum on or putting gold on or it it's it's um you know luxury in its association, I suppose. Mm. But for us it was about highlighting the fact that the 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 value here is in the liquid. So all of our story points towards the fact that the liquid is the incredible thing. And that's, you know, it's all about highlighting a truth there rather than adding a layer that is about expense. Yeah. No, that's, that's amazing. And, um, why is it not on your website? <laughs> good, good question, why, why Harry. Good, 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 good question. <laughs> Um, we've got a really exciting, um, I can tell you, we've got a very exciting micro site in the works. Um, so yeah, that's a fantastic digital um, experience that we hope to take kind of people on. Um, that is, that's a beyond just packaging. So something the everyday person can experience. Um, is that how you describe it, Harry? Yeah, absolutely. It's, we want our digital expression of this project to reflect the the concepts as well as possible and it, it, it is on the way i promise it's on the way and i feel like this is i feel like um this was scripted i feel like i've been targeted for, <laughs> for not having it ready yet <laughs> no no pressure <laughs> that's cool and, all right so like talking about the website like looking through it you you do um you do a lot of alcohol uh, I, I went through your b corp stuff i think you do 75 percent of your revenues through alcohol um, but you also do, you also do books, which it ties into packaging, you know, in terms of the way that it's wrapped and the, the way that you're telling a story through literally telling a story. Um, but I don't see very many agencies that are doing books anymore. So how, like, is that a separate team or, or what's the love of, of books here? No, definitely. It's, it's something that we have done historically. So when, when we set up the business, it was set up by myself. Um, my wife Kate and a lady called Kaz um, and Kaz's background was in publishing our background was more in branding and packaging and at the time we want you, you know the grass is always green right we were interested in books she was interested to not do books um, but she brought with her an amazing kind of back uh, catalogue of kind of contacts in that kind of publishing world and so we were able to sort of can you know develop different streams of work and, and books was one of those and the, the kind of economics of a book project versus a, another branding project are vastly different. So the the kind of fees associated with doing designing books is um yeah is is not a particularly commercial aspect of of the business, but it is an incredible learning experience. And it's also just um I think it's just an important part of the DNA of the business. So it's it's something that we want to maintain. I think w- within the studio we don't have a separate team at all. We we see it differently where everyone who works in the studio should have an opportunity to work on a book because you learn so much just doing, you know, it's a different, it's a different skill altogether and you learn different parts of design by designing a book, you know, whether it's about the line length or the, um, you know, the baseline grid or the, the way that you kind of construct the, the framework uh, for a book. So they're all really valuable lessons. So although, it's it's not a kind of huge kind of um, part of our income. It's a, a culturally, I think it's a, an important part of the studio. So we've actually just um, it's just been published at the moment, but we've just done a book on trees for Thames and Hudson, which is uh, launching imminently, and that's uh, kind of probably one of the bigger books that we've done recently. But we there's always there's always a few in the studio that we try and maintain so that people are kind of having the opportunity to work on them. Awesome. Will that be on the website before? <laughs> we, we, do you know what? Um, Probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what there's a phrase cobbler's shoe. Like so it's, 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 it's always dropped. Your own thing always yeah. drops at the bottom of the pad, doesn't it? So kind of that's how that's how dedicated we are to our clients. I feel like because we've meddled with time in the series, it, 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 time is now meddling with me, maybe in in, in getting it together. <laughs> No, but you know what? But this is this is like a like this is a real thing that that agencies deal with, right? Everything every agency is like we just cranked out this amazing work. It's getting tons of press, and we've got work to do. Like you have actual work 
you can't work on your own on, on your own stuff so yeah it's like the cobbler sheets so uh the cobbler's kids right it's like um but it's funny because like i think every agency kind of goes through this where they're like we got all this stuff we got all this work we've done amazing stuff and then you go to their site and they're like yeah it's not gonna be there. it's not gonna be up there for a while um what are you d- before we move on from from glenfiddich is there anything that you wanted to touch on that maybe we didn't cover I suppose just the reference to the 40 year olds, we talked about the 30 and 50 and mm-hmm. the 40 has its own sort of con- concept, which um, I'd love the chance to just sort of touch on um, yeah, of because it's in- it is very different. You know, we wanted the, the three designs to feel connected, um, but also to be these genuine different expressions of, of what time can mean. Um, and the 40 year old is um, created by a process called remnant vatting, which is where the vat of 40 year olds at Glenfiddich is, is never emptied. It, 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 they leave liquid in it and then add the, the next batch into the top. Um, it's sort of similar to the Solera process, but it's about this sort of accumulation of flavor. So in theory, there is liquid in that vat that has been in there for 80 years. but it's the 40 year old because that's the sort of primary stock that's added to it and then um, bottled from there. So we had this idea about a redefinition of time, which is a time being accumulated. So we're all, you know, all of time just layering one thing on top of the other. Um, and we felt that had a really nice sort of marriage with that liquid story. So we worked with um, an amazing company called Zone Creations to. Uh, workshop with some with jesmonite as a as a substrate as a material. Jesmonite is a um, sustainable uh, material made from uh, sort of geological powders. So they grind down different um, different stone mediums, and then it can then be sort of reconstituted into a new surface, um, and you can achieve lots of amazing finishes. And we set about creating essentially a, a stone surface that represents this remnant batting. Yeah. So you have the bottle held within this sort of stone casing and this really intricate layered design created with jesmonite on, on the sort of veneers that you see as you look through to the bottle, which represent this layering of flavor and this accumulation of, of, uh, of uh, yeah, of, flavor and information over the time that the 40 year old has been in in the barrel and we sort of wove some little details in there so there's veins of green glass which is ground down from the 12 year old uh, bottles which sort of features as little highlights within that surface as well as copper flex from the stills so it's almost taking sort of details of the process and of the uh, where the liquid has come from and creating this sort of geological um, expression for the bottle to sit in. What's your favorite of the three? I mean, personally, it, it it's probably the 50 year old. I think if only for the fact that it gave birth to the other two in, in the way that the process went about. But <laughs> I think knowing, knowing the process that we went through on and the, the trust with which Glenn Fiddick allowed us to pursue this idea, um, and that it's gleaned a result that we are really sort of proud of. And um, yeah, I think for myself, having been on that journey, I've got real affection for the 50. Emily, what's your favorite? Um, I'll go with 40. Yeah, no, I love I love the packaging. It feels quite sculptural from a design perspective. Um, and yeah, and I'll give 30 to Mark then. <laughs> <laughs> From me. I mean, I love them all. I love the I love the concept overall, but I think, like Harry, the journey we went on with fifty year olds to arrive, arrive at it, and and also just working with that that idea of translating data into physical form was a new experience for us, and it was kind of really fascinating. So, um, yeah, I I'd agree. I think the fifty year old, if I had to pick one, it's a bit like when you taste whiskey and they make you taste the younger, the older, the oldest, and of course, at the end of that tasting, the one you like the most yeah. is the oldest, most expensive whiskey. Can confirm the price now. It's for I think it's forty two thousand US dollars. The, for the for, fifty. Or which one? Yeah. The fifty. Wow. So it's like a ten thousand dollar difference between the thirty and the Ooh, fifty. No, I think it's more significant than that. Um, but I'll leave. Wow. Yeah. Did you guys get samples? Do you guys have like a bottle? Not really. <laughs> 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't. I think Harry, you might have had a taste at some point. No. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to say I have. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we are very fortunate, so we do get to taste um, some amazing whiskies, even if it's not those precise ones. But um, yeah, that that's the challenge. A file right. copy of the these packs becomes a bit more tricky, you know, because they're just there's literally not very many of them in the world. So it kind of it, it, we have to yeah. sort of borrow them to, to take photographs and things like that. So, so it, it, there's logistical challenges around it as well. How many of these were produced? I'm not entirely sure, actually. I think it's it might be a sort of annual release. I'm not sure. Uh, you might know. OK. Yeah, the 50, the 50 year old is uh, 220 decanters made for this year's release. And then they will follow up with another 220 next year. And wow. then um the volumes increase obviously down into 40 i'm not sure 40 is also a uh is is done by specific release so it was another it was another nice sort of nod to the the fact that every pack of 40 is different 40 is the one that they do a release of and then it changes whereas 30 is a sort of continuous variant you know it's it's pretty much consistent indefinitely for, for Glenfiddich, whereas the 40 did, I think they're on release 18, and then we'll do release 19 when that comes around. 